ready to go. The final set of presentations for the day. All right, so next up we have Seb talking about eChronos and IWIP. So take it away, Seb. Yep, no worries. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sebastian, and I'm going to be talking today about eChronos and LWIP. If you have not heard of either of those words, do not be afraid because I will be explaining them shortly. Um, but extremely rapidly, first up, um, a number of things have led to me being here today. It's actually my first LCA, um, but I've just finished my first year of an electrical engineering degree up in Sydney, and I'm currently working for an OS research group um, for CSIRO, uh, and that's kind of brought me here. So thanks, guys. Um, before I get into exactly what I want to talk about, I'll talk about what I've done. So what I've taken is the TI Connected Launchpad, which is a commonly available kind of dev board that you can get extremely cheaply, ported eChronos, which is a, a nice real-time operating system to it. And then I've ported LWIP, which is a TCP IP stack, to that. And then after doing all this, that's the majority of the work on the left there, um, I've created some quick and dirty demos, which are actually sitting over here, and I'll demonstrate later on. But what am I going to talk about? So I'm going to talk about eChronos, I'm going to talk about LWIP, I'm going to talk about some kind of interesting things that happen when these two things interact. Um, and I'm going to go through these hardware demos, but interspersed I'm also going to talk about some porting tricks and traps, stuff that I've come across. All right, so first things first was, well the first thing was hardware shopping. All right. So I needed something with an Ethernet controller to do IoT type things. I needed something with PWM. I needed something that was cheap. And we also happened to have these laying around, which was the main reason. <laughs> so <laughs> so, so um, yeah, went for this. Um, it's got an ARM Cortex-M4 on it. Um, and it's, it also has a completely open source tool chain. You can actually, from most Linux uh, distro repos, you can pull down uh, a completely functional tool chain, including the, the debugger, the, uh, the compiler, the, the program you use to flash the board, everything like that. All right, so who here has actually used an RTOS in an embedded project before? That's actually, okay, so we've got about a quarter of the people. That's really good. Um, I'll, I'll go through this a bit, well, I'll, I'll go through this anyway. Um, but basically, an RTOS is, uh, it's an extremely thin operating system intended for embedded processes, basically. And it makes some guarantees about execution time. You may have heard of these ones, uh, but when that, if you're trying to imagine a scenario in which they would be useful, um, think of perhaps you're working on an Arduino sketch or perhaps you're working on some sort of embedded project where you would have benefited from the use of threads or mutexes or, or something like that. That's the kind of scenario where you want to start to consider using an RTOS. So besides the fact that the people I work for made it, uh, it's actually interesting. <laughs> it's, it's open source. Um, it, you can actually go and have a look at it on GitHub if you're, GitHub if you're interested. Um, it is currently going through a formal verification process, the, the architecture is, which is extremely interesting uh, and, and very rarely done for real-time operating systems. Um, and it is absolutely tiny. I'm going to explain why it's absolutely tiny soon, um, but it kind of, the, the stage of making eChronos really tiny occurs in, in two different steps. So first step. This is a piece of code from the Python build system that construct, constructs C operating systems in eChronos. If I zoom in on that a little bit, you can see that it's built up of these little components. So you can basically take elements of operating systems that you want and just compose them together in this nice kind of Python script, and it'll spit out an operating system in the format that you want. Now, in saying this, uh, don't be kind of scared away by that because there's already a bunch of kind of uh, variants of operating systems existing, and most of the time you won't have to create your own variant. That's, that's what happens there. And if you're scared about the documentation being horrible, it isn't because it's also automatically generated and it has nice pictures and it is quite good. So, second stage of customization. Basically, in, in addition to your C implementation, you also have this kind of PRX file, which is an XML file. Um, and you, it, within it, you statically declare a bunch of things like uh, you can statically declare your interrupts, your uh, semaphores, your tasks, that sort of thing. And that sounds like a bad thing. I mean, you can imagine if you're trying to create an embedded project and you're, you, you're trying to do things, you might be, able to, you might be trying to allocate resources, you might be trying to do lots of different things, and you would think that having to statically allocate tasks, mutexes, semaphores would be a bad thing. But you actually get a number of benefits 
from doing that. Um, one is that it means that the build system can make optimizations. Uh, that's a good example there. And the second is that it's much easier to find bugs in uh, basically pieces of code that have statically allocated uh, primitives. And if, you're in, if, this, if any of this has made you interested in that operating system, there's actually a tutorial run by someone much smarter than me on Friday in this room. So, all right. Now, this is an interesting thing I came across. Let me just check. All right. Um, so, just to give you some context first, imagine you are running a system which has two tasks, right? Um, the way that an operating system determines which task is running is called a scheduler. And you can kind of categorize these schedulers into two different uh, sections, if you like. The first one is non-preemptive, and the second is a preemptive. So the difference between the two is if, you, if something happens, for example, an interrupt in the first task, which makes the second task, task B, of higher priority and runnable, then the processor, because it's a single core processor, we're, we're looking at some small piece of hardware, it won't actually switch until you've reached a yield instruction or you've called an OS function or something in task A. Whereas in a preemptive OS scheduler, you will um, switch as soon as something happens that changes these priorities. That's the difference between the two. Now this is important because I came across a bug whereby these things would completely uh, reset and, and do bad things only on uh, a preemptive scheduler and only in the simulator. Uh, uh, sorry, only on the hardware. In the simulator, it was fine. Right. So internally, this RTOS and actually some other ones as well use a couple of interrupts to do this preemptive instantaneous task switching. And it's common, well, you, you really want to set these two interrupts as the two lowest priorities in the system because when something important happens, for example, you're pressing a button on a a defibrillator or something, you want that interrupt to occur before, you want that to occur before the task switching interrupt because that sequence means that your task switching occurs as fast as possible. And that's the reason for that. But what this means is, um, well, when I say that you need to use the two lowest priority interrupts, a priority when you're talking in terms of interrupts is just if you have two interrupts that occur at the same time, the one of higher priority will execute before the one of lower priority. That's it. But in the context of the ARMv7 architecture, which is what these things run, um, a priority is apparently an 8-bit field in a 32-bit register. That's what ARM says it should be. That's in the, that's in the standard. Um, if you look at another standard for the Cortex-M4, they just say to look at the first one, so that's not very helpful. Uh, um, but yeah, anyway, so if, well, okay. I say that the two lowest priorities are 254 and 255. On ARM, highest priority is zero. That's just convention. Um, but that makes sense, given that they're giving us eight bits, right? And that's what I was using in the simulator. It was working fine. It was just on the hardware. It just wouldn't work. It would just completely crash. Oh, OK. <laughs> I absolutely spoiled it for you guys just then. But, but if, if you go and you look at, um, for example, the ST Microelectronics data sheet, and you go NVIC, subsection, interrupt priority, subsection, whatever, whatever, small print. We only use the highest four bits of that eight bit field. You, yeah, 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 yeah. The, the, so, so you can write to it, right? You can write to it as an eight bit field. You can read it back, and it's still the same data. It's just that for the purposes of interrupt resolution, they just go, nah, we're only going to worry about the first four bits for some reason. And then if you look at the TI data sheet, it's even worse. They only give you three. Uh, I don't, know, I don't know how many cents that saves you, but it. <laughs> a, well, it is. It, yeah, any random three. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 yeah. I I don't know. I don't know. Um, but yep, basically, it turns out that the silicon manufacturers, <laughs> I don't know, cut corners. So that resulted in a patch in the operating system. So. Had an operating system, had some hardware working. Next step was to try and get a TCP IP stack operating on top of the operating system. So, uh, we need a TCP IP stack. I basically just said that already. Sorry about that. And went for LWIP. Main reason for this was because, some of you may have heard of LWIP. Um, it 
it actually already supported the majority of the physical layer um, required by these boards. So that removed uh, a bit of the work. There was st I still needed to create the, the glue code to get the operating system talking to the TCP IP stack, but the physical layer was already there. All right. Now, here is some information about LW LWIP. Um, it is ridiculously tiny, um, and it allows you to do things like send HTTP requests, respond to pings, that's actually implicit, um, listening to things, just kind of normal internet-y things. Uh, but when you want to use LWIP on your platform, there's two things you have to do, which is what I was talking about earlier. You actually have to implement the physical layer, which is how uh, the library talks to the physical ethernet thing that sits on the chip. Um, and the second thing is you have to implement things that LWIP needs. All right, so here's some of the things that I had to implement using eChronos. Now these look all right um, until you start to see things like sysarc thread new or sysmbox new, or, oh, I'm doing something, um, or sysm new. Now that doesn't seem to be a problem, but then you think about the fact that uh, what I said earlier about all your OS primitives have to be declared statically in a PRX file, you, you, you can't do that. All right, that's just not part of the operating system. So there's two ways you can kind of uh, deal with this. And the first way is that you just basically look through the LWIP source code and you just try and find things that is possible to replace with static things. Uh, and that's what I just said. And it was actually interesting because all the tasks in LWIP ended up being able to be declared statically. Some of the other OS primitives, not so much, but the tasks themselves, they actually were all able to be transitioned from a dynamic to a static uh, primitives. Right, second thing, basically cheating. Um, the solution was basically to allocate a bunch of dummy primitives in the static file uh, and then to determine how many of these static things to make, ping the crap out of this thing, do lots and lots of HTTP requests, and then I ended up with an, an example number, for example, uh, I think it was eight mutexes, I would never exceed that after doing lots and lots of traffic benchmarks. And then I went, ah, I'll set it to 16 and it'll probably never die. That's, that was basically my justification on that one. <laughs> um, but, so that's it for LWAP. Um, now I'm going to go on to these things. These are actually, so the hardware itself is not extremely interesting, but the, both of these demos here are running eChronos and, oh, that one just turned off. Uh, and LWIP. I'm gonna put this one upside down. There you go. <laughs> All right, so, um, oh, I haven't even turned the Geiger counter on. What am I doing? Jeez. All right. Okay. Uh, how, am I, how am I going for time? All right. Okay. So I'm just going to make sure that they're actually still connected. All right. So the network topology here, just sorry, is um, I've got these two um, connected launch pads. One is hooked up to a couple of lights, does some PWM. One is connected to an old Geiger counter. Uh, they're both connected to a, a router, and that's broadcasting a network which I am connected to wirelessly. Please don't hack into it right now. Um, all right. Hey. <laughs> so I can change the brightness. I can do things like that. So. That's that, and second example of the stack operating is the Geiger counter, which is sitting here, and something which I'm surprised got through airport security. <laughs> this will take a while to register because it has a 10 second window. Hey, there we go. Radioactivity. <laughs> All right. So, um, I seem to have fallen short of time, but that is it from me. So, any questions? 
Oh, it does support IPv6, yeah. Does that SSL layer... Oh, that's not that SSL, that's SSL. Telnet. I oh, know, I mean in the, the guide counters on the left. Uh, is that HTTPS? is server-side inclusion, yeah. It's, it's quite simple. Yeah. SSI. Yeah. Questions? Did you look at a S using SSL at all? Because it's like when I looked at it a while ago, there was yep. very many good SSL libraries to go via double IP. Oh, was there? Okay. There you might no, there wasn't. Oh, there wasn't. Right. Well, that's probably the reason why I didn't consider it. Then. <laughs> <laughs> no more questions? Oh, yes. Grant? Can you, so if you have to check every data sheet for every device to determine how oh, yeah, it's, many it's bits ridiculous, they're, going, isn't it? the, they're yeah. going to use, how do you actually end up implementing that in the core system in a reliable, repeatable, extensible So it was, origin way? It, it was originally uh, hard-coded to work for a specific, uh, well, for the emulator, basically. Awesome. And so now it is not. <laughs> <laughs> and it does ask you to, to put those parameters in there. So it, it basically won't, it, it won't work unless you uh, tell it what those numbers are. So, so since you're trying to create a, a verifiable so software system, uh, but which now depends upon unreliable hardware, um, how will you um, <laughs> deal with that? Will you basically say this verified software has been verified against this hardware or just... Yeah, that's the interesting mm. thing, isn't it? it, it I, I think you get to a point where the hardware itself is... Um, I mean, if the, if the hardware is different to what you model, then obviously you're going to have problems. So. If I can just comment on that, the uh, verification, and by the way, I'm, I'm Sebastian's supervisor, uh, the verification goes down to the ARM model that comes from Cambridge University. So if the hardware we've got doesn't match that model, then all bets are off. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was when I gave Sebastian this work to do, I was expecting him to take about 10 weeks. He took 10 days. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? No? Okay. So, everybody, let's thank Sebastian. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs>